complex, much too complex, too complex, much too complex, too complex, too 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 complex, too 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 complex. Good afternoon. My name is James K. Holder II. Some of you may know me as Sir James II, and I'd like to welcome you back to Not On My Watch. As always, I'd like to ask you to subscribe, like, comment, and share. I want you to retweet this and repeat this. If you're watching, it is Wednesday, July 12th, 2017, and Donald Trump is still president for some reason. <laughs> Now, I will say... Uh, This week has been a little crazy. Yesterday, the White House formally admitted that they did collude with Russian agents to overthrow the election for uh, Donald Trump as opposed to Hillary Clinton. Uh, Don Jr., along with uh, Jared Kushner, both met with a Russian lawyer who had dirt on Hillary Clinton. And this happened um, basically several months before the election. I believe it was June. Um, And it's crazy. There was a whole story about it. There was a whole news cycle yesterday where basically Donald Jr. came ahead of a story from the New York Times that was going to, you know, out him about having had this meeting where he released the emails. And Donald Trump then, of course, applauds his son for being transparent and innocent and doing the right thing and high quality of all things as if he was some Persian rug. But um, that's neither here nor there. Donald Trump Jr. lies like a rug, but he's not a high-quality Persian rug. So I'll let you make your own judgments there. Um, along with that occurrence, right? So I want to talk about, let's not even talk about just the absurdity of where we are with our current government. Let's talk about all the things that happened around it. It was no coincidence that when The, the story broke about Don Jr.'s collusion, admitted collusion. There was a huge surge in bots um, of, alt, of the alt-left um, attacking us, or harassing us, rather, on Twitter. Now, there was one person in particular. This whole thing was kind of funny. It was like the resistance yearbook. There was a list that came out, and it was about 25, it was 25 faces on it. Mine was one of them. There were many notable figures on this list that I talk about on the show, Eric Bollert. Uh, Joy Reid, uh, Cara Calavera, uh, Al Giordano, uh, you, you name it. I mean, it, it was a veritable who's who of the resistance, people who really just don't hold their tongues uh, when it comes to this. But this list comes out, and it was kind of a joke because it was somebody who is, was a Bernie bro saying, These are people that you need to go, you know, follow and basically harass. And then it ended up being that we were all sort of stunned to be listed all together. And it was kind of like a red carpet thing, like online, where we all just kind of joked about it and what we were going to wear to the party and how we were going to show up. And this was our, our high school reunion. It was cool. It, like it was formed like a yearbook. Anyway, so that happens. And, you know, as a result, normally what would happen if somebody like, sent targeted harassment towards your page, you would get a bunch of like bots or you'd get a bunch of people like just sort of saying different things on a particular post. And what happened with this is there was just sort of this massive, like multiple people went on this list and then underscored the photo with the list of people who to follow and sort of made a negative, made a positive out of a negative. So like I got like maybe 2,500 followers off of this one post from this troll who was trying to send people to harass our accounts. That was within like the first 24 to 36 hours of having that list published. The next day, however, when all this stuff was being discussed is when you started getting just sort of just this really high level of vitriol from the, the, the most grungy, grimy uh, Bernie bros and Uh, Jill Stein people. I mean, it was really just disgusting to the point where I was, I had to walk away from Twitter for a, a few hours just because it was just so frustrating. And then I eventually muted the conversation and that got rid of most of it. But it just, it, it, there's no coincidence. You can't tell me that there isn't an overlap between trying to cover up this Russian collusion, trying to distract people who are reporting on it, and um, 
the alt left and the Bernie Sanders wing and the Jill Stein people and all these people who have colluded, Tad Devine, all these people, there's something going on there. Another thing, my personal website or my professional website rather was hacked again. I mean, again, when I when this these spikes happen, they start going after your own personal information. So again, I've been hacked on my website, which I don't even. I really don't even promote my website anymore. After a- enough times of people threatening to come and see me, I just took my website off of my Twitter. I took all of my sort of personal information off so that people couldn't really access me as, as easily. I mean, it's still, if you wanted to find me, you could. And I welcome anybody to come knock, I'd knock at this door because <laughs> you will be met with resistance, at least. But I just feel like we have to be honest about what's really going on in this country. Um, as we speak, Christopher Wray, um, who is Trump's nominee for the replacement of Jim Comey, who I couldn't stand that motherfucker anyway, um, is now being sort of, uh, he's experiencing his Senate confirmation hearing, where they're actually considering replacing the director of the FBI with someone who is under investigation by the FBI. Like, it doesn't really make sense to me. But... I say all that to say, despite everything that has come up, despite all that we know about Trump Russia, despite all that we know about the fact that we didn't have a legitimate election, nothing's going to change in this country. You know, my mom predicted that Trump would be gone by Independence Day. That didn't happen. I, more, a little less, more skeptical, said, okay, well, maybe Bastille Day. I was, I, I jokingly said, maybe he'll be gone by Bastille Day, which is July 14th. Um, and we'll see. Um, We'll see. There's still two more days for that to happen. It could happen. I doubt it. But we'll see. Um, But regardless, nothing is going to change materially in this country until we get to the crux of what caused this problem. And that answer is white people. I'm sorry. Not all white people. But the reality is, we have Donald Trump as our president, yes, because of Russian collusion, yes, because of voter suppression, yes, because of all these external factors that played into um, the results that landed us here. But when it comes down to it, we're talking about the main fact that when the votes were tallied, had there, save for 53% of white women voted for Donald Trump, and 63% of white men voting for Donald Trump, this man would not be president of the United States. It wouldn't matter what Vladimir Putin did. These, and these are people who know. We were all warned about the Russian collusion. We were all warned about Trump's bigotry. And yet, these white voters still chose this man to be president. And so I want to have a conversation with my white friends today because, you know, y'all are out there and I talk, I engage with white people a lot on on social media. And I say that because I get a lot of resistance when I bring up this fact. You know, if I post that most people voted for, most white people voted for Donald Trump, I get all these emails of not all white people voted for Donald Trump. I didn't say all, I said most. Oh, it's not most, it's many. Oh, it's not most, it's a majority. It's, I get all these excuses. And I'm really just sick of it. And what we have to do is realize that we have a problem in this country. And it's rooted in otherness. And that stems from white male dominance and privilege and exclusivity. That because Donald Trump represented something that was unattainable to others in this country, there was some aspect of preservation and privilege that, was, that came along with voting for him to be president. Um, many other non-white people took it, tried to jump on the bandwagon of that and become a part of that and be aspirational in their voting to say, okay, well, I'm going to vote for Donald Trump because I want lower taxes, even though I'm not in that bracket of people who he would be taxing. I plan to be in the next eight years, so I'm going to vote this way because it's exclusive, it's cool, it's trendy, and, you know, her emails, whatever. So I just want to take a moment and discuss how to be a better ally. Because, you know, it doesn't bother me that a lot of white people voted for Donald Trump. It doesn't surprise me. It doesn't bother me that a lot of white people want to deny the fact that most white people voted for Donald Trump. But the problem is when you have people who are allies, people who are Democrats, people who claim to want to be a part of the resistance, who 
in fact are supporting Donald Trump by pretending that this isn't why he got elected or that these aren't the realities of where we are in America. So we have to be real about this. So let's talk about it. Um, I've broke this down into 12 manageable chunks of how to be a better ally. Um, I think the first and foremost thing is that you have to take a self-awareness inventory of where you are. Um, you have to be able to step outside of your experiences and say, okay, am I racist? Um, what are my biases? One good way to do this, I mean, I did this and everybody who probably went to college and took a psychology course. Psych 101, everybody goes to this website and takes these trainings and they take this um, implicit association test. This is something that's offered uh, through Harvard's website. It is implicit.harvard.edu. You can go there, you can take a test to determine your implicit attitude towards gay people, implicit attitude towards white people, implicit attitude towards women or men. Anything that you feel is, is something outside of your group or maybe with, even within your group, you should take this test um, and just as a baseline for people who say, I'm not racist, but you know, niggas be getting on my nerves. Like, no, okay, maybe you're a little bit racist, tinge. Uh, and, and if you can, if you can be honest about that and if you can expose yourself and be vulnerable to learning about yourself and where you are, you're in a better position to now combat those, those issues. That'd be the first thing. The second thing I would ask people to do is consider your life circumstances and determine how would they be different if you were black. Um, a lot of times when you bring up, you know, one time I brought up uh, Bernie Sanders' free college plan and why it really wasn't a good thing for black students. And you get all these non-black people who don't understand why free college for all students would negatively impact black students. But when you have a system that's segregated where black students don't get the proper preparation for college and applying to college, where we don't have the AP courses, we don't have um, the standardized testing scores you know, averages from our schools, we really are underprepared when it comes to applying to college. So making something free when you still have to pass another check mark to get in, to be accepted, um, doesn't really make it more accessible. Because unless you improve the situation and our resources to become accepted into college, making it more, more affordable doesn't make it more accessible to us. It doesn't make it easier for us to get in or take advantage of these free scholarships, and yet we're now encumbered with the burden of paying for those scholarships, paying for that, that price. And also, um, Bernie Sanders' free college plan initially called for the defunding of historically black colleges and universities. I mean, we talked about this in a couple episodes before. So you really do have to be willing to understand what we're saying. If you grew up in a black neighborhood and were subject to going to black schools where there's mold in the books or silver fish in the water fountain, how does that impact your, your life circumstances, your life's work? If you went to a black school or if you were black, um, you know, maybe you went to college on a swimming or a diving scholarship. But if you went to a black school that didn't have a swimming pool, how would you, how would you have had a swim team? How would you have been able to to get that same opportunity to go to college. Those are things that I'm, I'm wanting you to look at. And look at it on a really, really granular level. Like, don't just say, oh, well, my life wasn't easy just because I was white. White privilege doesn't mean that your life is easy. It means that your life isn't difficult because you're white. That your, your whiteness is not the cause of the reason why you're having problems. So that would be the second question I would ask you. The third thing I want you to do is to learn to understand and appreciate black struggles within the context of American generational oppression and white supremacy. Um, it's very important to recognize that the issues that black people face now are in part because there was a, there was a trend set to one, create a, a system of privileges for white people under white supremacist law and slavery and Jim Crow. And, and those things have continued to impact how we are we're viewed and how we experience life as Americans today. And so if you're not willing to recognize that, you know, black people have been in this country since um, 
September 20th, what is it, September 20th? August 20th, 1619. You know, that was the day that the first 20 slaves arrived on a Dutch ship in the United States. And so we have to be really willing to accept and understand as a society that from 1619 up until 1865, black people were, according to the Constitution, we were allowed to be owned by white people. Yes, black people could be owned by other black people, but black people couldn't own white people. So slavery is a racist institu institution. The subsequent 100 years were nothing but Jim Crow and segregation. And yes, that was fairly limited to the South, but culturally it did, it was ubiquitous within the country. Um, so we have to be accepting of that fact and that it's, we're really only talking about the last 50 years since certain rulings like Brown versus Board of Education that we've seen the ability for black people to be sort of upwardly mobile and, and have access to the same opportunities as white people. I mean, in the, in, since, you know, George Washington, we've only had one black president out of 45. So that, again, should be an indicator that Black people are not equal. Black people don't have the same access to opportunities as white people do. And we have to be more conscious about why those things are. What are the things that have contributed to those situations where black people aren't achieving the same level of success, aren't achieving the same levels of wealth as white people? You know, you talk about generational wealth, accumulation. If you can inherit a house that you, that you're, that's been in your family since the 18th century or since the 17th century, black people weren't own, allowed to own property back then. Black people were property back then, you know? And so when it comes to looking at redlining and gentrification and just every aspect of just the ways that property owned um, by blacks when that was allowed has been stripped and the value has been stripped and devalued and taken away generationally um, and not allowed to pass on as it has with black, white neighborhoods, you really have to begin to understand that things like um, segregation, keeping black people in certain neighborhoods, and then allow, being able to now devalue those properties is a generational wealth issue. It's one thing that keeps black people from achieving success, achieving wealth and opportunities. So you have to take everything within context. If you don't, if you ignore um, America's white supremacist history, there's no way you can be a, a true ally or an agent of change in what we're trying to do. Four, listen to black voices on matters of race more than white ones. I'm not saying there aren't white people out there who are woke and aware, but you have to be able to understand what we're saying and in addition to that, you also must recognize that all black people aren't going to think the same way about the same issues. You know, I think I was faced with a lot of, you know, well, you should vote for Bernie Sanders because ta Coates votes for Bernie Sanders or wants you to vote for Bernie Sanders. Okay, I don't, ta Nehisi who? Like, I don't know that person. I haven't read that person's books. Um, Angela Davis wants you to vote for Bernie Sanders. Okay, that's great for her. I'm not Angela Davis. I don't have to vote the way Angela Davis would. Cornell West. People cherry pick all these, you know, black voices that say Hillary Clinton is bad. But when it comes down to it, again, you're talking about the high 90s percentage of 94 percent of black women voted for Hillary Clinton. 80, what, 6 percent of black men or 87 percent of black men voted for Hillary Clinton. So. How is it that I'm responsible to obey the directives of a Cornell West who has his own motivations, obviously, um, as opposed to just going along with the clear majority and bulk of voters within my cohort? You can say the same thing about the primary. Most very clearly black people voted for Hillary Clinton, not Bernie Sanders. There were reasons for this. You know, so there, there were reasons why these things happened the way that they did. And it's really difficult to pretend that, you know, we all think unilaterally, we all think along the same line, but you also have to be able to defer to black voices on black issues that have experienced the things that white people have not. Because when you talk about racism in a very, from a very intellectual point of view, or even a, a psychological point of view, you're gonna miss some experiential aspect if you're only listening to white people or people who are saying the same thing. Um, the fifth thing I want you to do 
is show up and learn our script. So, you know, people always talk about, uh, you know, listen and, 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 and all these things that you have to do. Listening is a starting point. That's number four. But showing up is also important. It's not enough to just hear it on the radio, hear it on TV in bits and pieces and then think that you're able to contribute, you really have to be present. You should march with us, show up and be a part of what we, how we interact. Come to our church services, come to our school plays, come to things that we do that are separate from what you do because that's the only way you're going to experience and learn and begin to really, really take in and digest the, the learned experiences and shared experiences that we have that you can now begin to get a better understanding of. Um, and when I say learn our script, I mean, quite simply, if you asked, you know, many black people what was a big contributing factor to why voter turnout was suppressed by black voter turnout was suppressed for Hillary Clinton, white people would say that white people who, again, most of which voted for Donald Trump would say, Black people hated Hillary Clinton. That's not necessarily the case. What most black people would say, I would think, would be that they, would, they might point to the fact that this was the first election since the gutting of the Voting Rights Act. And of course, while enthusiasm might not have been as high to elect the first black president as Hillary Clinton, you can't argue that there wasn't a clear line of support there and that there weren't external factors that suppressed that vote. So that's one thing that I mean by learn our script. It's not enough for you to just assume that, oh, well, this is the reason why black people didn't show up because they weren't as excited or we needed to put a black person on, on the ticket. No, that's not it. We have to have access. And if you don't understand what we're going through and what we're saying are the problems, you'll never know how to find those solutions. Say for the gutting of the Voting Rights Act, Hillary Clinton would be president. And, but yet you have states where, you know, many people, countless people were blocked from the ballot and specifically people who were targeted were people of color. Um, let's move on to number six. Once you know our script, that's when you're ready to help by amplifying our voices. Um, when you know what we're saying, it's just kind of like joining a choir, you know? Some people show up to choir practice first day, you want a solo. You haven't earned a solo yet. You don't even know the words to this song yet. You haven't listened long enough. So you got to listen, you got to show up to, to rehearsal, learn the script, learn the lyrics to the words. Then you can sing with us. You're adding value by adding your voice to ours. It changes the sound a little bit. It, it, it enrich, enriches the sound. It, it gives it a stronger voice. It gives us more power. Um, when you help amplify our voice, but not if you're singing loud and wrong, not if you're off key, not if you're off beat. So you got to know what the script is. You got to be able to add value in that way. So I always say, learn the script first. That's five, and then six. Then take that step to start speaking on our behalf with us, alongside us. Join in the conversation. Uh, work with us to communicate to people of color and and white people about bigotry, about racism, about white supremacy, about white male dominance narratives. Um, seven, as you're learning the script, as you're getting comfortable speaking out against this stuff, then you can start learning to independently recognize and reject racism. Um, you know, my definition of racism is that it's anything that aligns with or supports white male dominance narratives. When you have a system of prejudice added to power, the, white, the power structure in the United States being a white power structure that works to um, elevate white men specifically above all others, that should be what you should learn to recognize. So if somebody says something to you like, oh well, women get paid less because they don't work as hard as men. You should understand that as a white male power narrative because, no, there's really no, re there's nothing that a man can do that a woman can't do. So saying that women don't work as hard as men or they don't work as many hours and that's why their paychecks are less than ours is really quite ridiculous. But you should be able to recognize that that's something that someone has told this person to repeat, 
to keep going and keep amplifying so that it keeps us in, it's an explanation to keep you quiet and oh yeah, that kind of makes sense. Men work longer hours or men are stronger. Men run faster times in the Olympics. So, okay, but the person, Joe Schmo working at McDonald's making 15 cents more than Jessica Schmo ain't running in the Olympics. It's not Carl Lewis versus Flojo. So there is no point to try to bring up those extremes of, oh, well, in this case, because it's not a, there's really no competition. No one's, I mean, we know that men and women are capable of doing the same things, except we've never had a female president in this country. Why not? So that's what we need to work against. And it works against people of color and it works against women in the same way. Many of those narratives overlap. And if we can learn to recognize those, we can learn to work against them much more efficiently. Number eight, um, take, take the initiative to apply this information to your daily interactions um, with others. So, you know, it's great to talk about racism. Um, it's great to talk with white allies about racism and bigotry. But at some point, it's better if you're talking to people who don't understand this concept. At some point, you have to evangelize and take those seeds and branch out and start spreading the message to others so that they know and understand and can learn from what you've learned from us. Um, you know, every time I post about most black people, most white people voted for Donald Trump, I get all this pushback. Oh, well, I didn't vote for Donald Trump, so it's not my fault. Okay, but look at your immediate family. Did people who you grew up with in, in, at home, did they vote for Donald Trump? Did your parents vote for Donald Trump? Did your brother and sister, niece, nephew vote for Donald Trump? If so, those are people you should have been talking to, not me. You shouldn't be talking to me about the excuses of why you're excused because you voted the right way, even though you sat and remained silent at Thanksgiving the year before when people were talking all this stuff about evil Hillary and her emails. You should have been working to correct that then. And it's never too late, but you have to start now and you have to stop trying to excuse yourself of that responsibility. Um, which brings us to number nine. Take responsibility for correcting America's race problem. Who's responsible for fixing racism and white supremacy? Is it black people? Why? That doesn't make any sense. It should be all of ours, but specifically white people. They're the ones that benefit from systems that oppress people of color the most. So it's rightful that you take an active role in correcting this. Take responsibility, take ownership, and claim it as a problem that you are going to commit to working towards solving. And start small. Um, start at home, and then, then grow it and expand it. Because no one's saying that you are solely responsible, that you have to fix this as your problem. But you have to take responsibility. You have to be willing to commit to resolving this with us um, and not just expecting us to carry the burden or accept the consequences of the way the chips fall because you haven't decided to take an active role. Um, Ten, this is an important one. Do not use your good intentions in exchange for value from marginalized people. Don't expect credit or a pat on the back. Um, you know, voting for Hillary Clinton is great. Voting for Barack Obama is great. But I'm not going to give you a cookie for that. I'm not going to give you a medal for that. I'm not going to give you the key to the city for that. You, you know, that's the basis. That's what you should have done anyway for your own country. That's the best for everybody. So you don't get some special treat for not being racist. That's not being humane, being nice, being reasonable, being um, accepting, being tolerant of others is its own reward. It is not, you know, for us to say, oh, well, I owe you this much value of my own self because you're helping to undo everything that you've benefited from in your entire life. That's sort of ridiculous, right? So you have to stop expecting that people of color owe you something because you're standing up with us. That this is your own responsibility. This is our work to do. We have to do the work. Um, Eleven, uh, continually confront your own inner biases and work against them. I mean, you might even say you're going to go back and go take that impl implicit attitudes test from Harvard. Um, you might say, I'm going to continually go back and look at past writings, past language. What was my tense when I wrote about solving the race problem in America? Did I take a really passive um, sentence structure when I discussed how I wanted to see things happen in the future? Is it 
oh, things will get better in America, the race problem will get better in America, or is it, I'm going to work to make sure that these problems don't exist anymore. I'm going to work within my community to make sure that policing is not racist. I'm going to work to make sure that when I see a black person in my neighborhood who isn't up to suspicious activity, I'm not going to just call the police because I don't recognize that person. Because that's where the problems lie. When you just kind of passively fall into these attitudes and these, these, uh, these habits of, I'm just going to call the police every time I see somebody who looks suspicious. But if your definition of suspicious is brown or black, then it's going to lead to more problems. It's going to lead to more racist policing. It's going to lead to more uh, shooting deaths of unarmed black people. It, that's just a, a par for the course. And you have to realize that t your visual on what is suspicious, those implicit biases contribute significantly to the way those things happen. And in your initial assessment of what your, what your viewpoint is and what your, your um, attitudes are, you must continually reassess. You have to reevaluate. You have to see what your own growth has been. And you can't really just leave it to people who, that you, who you know because they're always going to tell you, oh, you're doing good. You're, you're doing so much for black people. Oh, you went to that Bernie Sanders rally and talked about how horrible Hillary Clinton's uh, super predator comment was. So you're doing great things for black people. That didn't really help black people. And black people told you that didn't help because we voted for Hillary Clinton not the person who voted for the crime bill. So you have to, which would, would be Bernie Sanders, by the way, done a little bit of shade there. Um, so you have to be able to really process all of this stuff at once. There's two more, and I want to um, end it with those two. One, you have to continually confront your inner biases. Oh, wait, sorry. I'm oh, sorry, that was 11. So the last one is um, never place your wants and desires before those you aspire to advocate on behalf of. And that's, I think that's just crucial within helping. You know, you have to be able to say, as a white person, yes, you might want, you know, more job opportunities, you might want socialism, you might want all these other things. But be honest about that. If your number one priority is helping white people by the avenues of white exclusivity and white privilege and white male dominance that we've seen that have already always existed in America, be honest about that. Just vote for what's going to give you that. Don't do this stupid third party vote and say, oh, you're voting for Jill Stein because she's in favor of reparations. But you know Jill Stein doesn't have a snowball's chance in hell of being president. So instead of voting for, along with us to amplify our votes, amplify our voice and support the candidate that we chose, you're not being an ally when you're doing these other things. You're being a radical. You're being somebody else. And it doesn't really help us. You're not helping. And I don't want you to, you don't get credit for this, oh, well, my intention was, no, your intentions don't matter. It's only about the result. And we told you what this was going to be. So you cannot, no, you can't be a, 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 an ally if you voted for Donald Trump. No, you actually can't be an ally if you voted third party. You can't be an ally if you stayed home. You know, if you're one of these white people who doesn't, who continually confronts people who bring up the fact that most white people voted for Donald Trump, you're not an ally. If you, if you think it's bad that most white people voted for Donald Trump, but you think it's worse that, you know, only 33% of Americans voted, okay, maybe you should worry about voter ID laws that you should have been working against all along because that contributed to that number. If you're disgusted by this number, you still passively coalesced around something that benefited you because when black people votes are suppressed, white people votes are amplified, whether they're on the left or the right. And so, again, if you're not an advocate for voting rights of black people, you're not an ally. You can't be. With that, I would like to thank you for watching episode 22 of Not On My Watch. I'd like to thank you for watching all previous episodes. And this concludes our season. Uh, we have had, the, this has been the first season. This is my first time doing a, a podcast, web series, uh, video situation. And I really appreciate all the support. It's really grown a long way. Uh, we've been trying to do so much and, and, and learn from our, my mistakes and, and figure out how to incorporate different things. And so uh, this show will be back in August of 2017. So I'm just going to take a couple of weeks off and come back with something new, something fresh, a little bit of a different set, a little bit chapters in 
the, the post, hopefully going to try to improve some things. Um, maybe get a podcast on Apple and not GrooveShark. Oh, it's not GrooveShark, it's uh, SoundCloud. Um, but we wouldn't be able to do anything without our friends of the show. And specifically, I want to first thank everyone who has signed on to become a producer-level sponsor of The Counter TV, which is my new cooking show, which will debut in August as well. So we're going to go away for like two or three weeks, tape really aggressively, and do some previews for the next season and the first season of The Counter TV, uh, which I've talked about in the previous episode, if you'd like more details on that. But um, these people have been supportive throughout, but uh, specifically I want to thank these eight people who have donated at least $100 to become producer-level sponsors of this show, of uh, The Counter TV. Uh, they gave that money to www.paypal.me slash jkh2. They are Ellen B. of Boston, Massachusetts, Anita C. of Fort Myers, Florida, uh, Faye M. of San Francisco, California, Christopher B. from Sweden, uh, a man... Amanda N. of Elkton, Maryland, uh, Donna D. of Collegeville, Pennsylvania, uh, Andrew K., and Karen I. of San Francisco, California. So uh, they add to a list of about uh, 10 others who have previously donated that $100 amount to be a producer-level sponsor of the show. If you'd like to be a producer-level sponsor in exchange, and thank you, you will be labeled as a producer in all 12 episodes of um, The Counter TV when it airs uh, in the first season. Uh, people who donate up to $100 uh, cumulative uh, by the time you know, the first episode airs will be listed as a producer up until um, any episode after that. But separate from that, um, anyone who donates to this link, uh, www.paypal.me slash jkh2, will receive a thank you on this show and also um, on the Twitter page at jkh2 in perpetuity. So uh, those people are uh, Sandra F. of Brooklyn, New York, Sarah S., Natasha R., Shannon H. of Brooklyn, New York, uh, Delisha M. of Carrollton, Texas, Stacy R. of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Elizabeth C., our first donor to the show from Sanford, Florida, still supporting. Thank you so much, uh, Elizabeth. Uh, Benjamin V., Tracy V. of uh, Mechanicsville, Virginia, Nakato N. Strong Tree Coffee Roasters of Florida, uh, Patrice T. of Ashland, Oregon, Deborah T. of Oakland, California, Laura K., Julia F. of Ellicott City, Maryland, Tony B. of Milwaukee, Oregon, uh, Cordell G. of Cofield, North Carolina, Greg S. of Murphy, North Carolina, uh, Joseph R. of Groveland, Maryland, sorry, Groveland, Massachusetts, M.A., uh, Lene K, uh, Karen K, Vanessa N of Canton, Georgia, Jared O of Decatur, Georgia. What's up, Jared? Uh, and that's it. So I just want to, again, thank you all so much for supporting and watching and following on Twitter, following uh, at JKH2, following uh, at Not On My Watch TV, following at The Counter TV. And I hope that you will continue to join us uh, as we return in August of 2017 with new episodes of Not On My Watch and also The Counter TV, which will be available at www.thecountertv.com. Um, and also, it'll probably show up on this same YouTube channel. So if you subscribe to this YouTube channel now, which you should already be, uh, it, you'll be able to see episodes of that show when it launches. Um, and with that, as always, I'd like to invite you to relax, relate, and resist. Thank you. Two